Now, I'd like to extend the concept of Fourier series from two pi periodic functions to two L periodic functions. And this really only amounts to a change of scale. Let's suggest we have a function g of alpha, and it's defined exactly as we had earlier on for a two pi periodic function. The next thing we're going to do is a change of scale, and this really amounts to a sleight of hand. And if you wonder how this in fact works, I'm sure if you sit, just sit back, absorb it, you'll see in fact that this is a clever way of doing this change of scale and going from twice pi to twice L periodic functions. Let's say that our alpha is equal to pi times t over L. That, in other words, that t is L times alpha over pi. Let's substitute that into our function g of alpha. And plugging in thereafter, we get our new Fourier series for our twice L periodic function. What's important to note here is that we now have our period, or half our period in fact, in front of the a sub n, the b sub n, and, and the full period in front of a sub zero. And we talk about having the argument of our cosine is n pi r over L. What's interesting here is we are already introducing the concept of the frequency domain because the argument of cosine and sine and all these must be dimensionless. So, well, n pi of course is dimensionless, so let's just ignore n pi for the moment. But r is not dimensionless. Let's say, in fact, we actually had t. Just say we had t for the moment, where we're in the time domain. If we're in the time domain, well then of course the units on time are the second, or the unit on time is the second. In order for us to have a dimensionless argument of cosine, we need to divide by something whose unit is per second, or hertz in this particular case. So that means L has units of per second. Now let's say in fact we didn't have T, but rather we had X. We would have X measured, let's say, in meters, it would mean that L would have to be measured in per meters. So L would be our spatial frequency. So we are already talking about the frequency domain. Furthermore, what we're actually doing here is writing our function in terms of cosines and sines. So we're using cosine and sine as our basis functions. Now what does this mean? Well, if we're talking about the normal Cartesian coordinates, we can talk about i hat, we can talk about j hat and k hat in order to describe every point in three dimensional space. But if you want to talk about, let's say, spherical polar coordinates, you might talk about r hat, theta hat, and phi hat. But these unit vectors will describe every point that the first unit vectors would do. Similarly, if you introduce the cylindrical coordinates, you would see that in, in fact these would also do the exact same job. So we're using different bases to describe the same points in space, but the different bases have different properties which makes the mathematics simpler. So what the Fourier series is doing is changing the basis from whatever it was at the start to now using functions instead of vectors to describe the uh, the, the space. So we're using cosines and sines as our basis functions instead of having basis vectors. So the Fourier series is already introducing the concept of the frequency domain and a change of basis. If this is something which is new to you, don't worry, it's something I will discuss in greater depth when we're deriving the Fourier transform proper. The next thing I'd like to discuss is the concept of oddness and evenness. This is very important. Cosine is an even function because it satisfies this particular expression. Sine is an odd function because it satisfies this particular expression. How do we use that in the study of Fourier series? Well, just to suggest what a odd function and an even function would look like graphically, we see here that an even function is symmetric around the y-axis.
where we see that an odd function is symmetric around the origin. If we then look at the product of, or the products of odd and even functions, we see the product of two even functions is even, the product of two odd functions is even, and the product of an odd function and an even function is odd. Why is this, why is this important? If we go back to the definition of our a sub n's and our b sub n's, we see that we're multiplying our input function, let's say f of r, using our dummy variable, multiplied by either a cosine or a sine. What this means is that where our, we'll say where our f of r is even, we see the integral is going to be non-zero. And the reason that is, is that even functions don't integrate to zero, excuse me, don't integrate to zero on an even interval. However, the odd functions, odd functions do integrate to zero on an even integral. So what that means is that where f of r is odd, the integral itself for a sub n is going to be equal to zero. Similarly, where f of r is even, the b sub n's are going to be equal to zero, and f of r is odd, the b sub n's are going to be non-zero. This means that if you look at f of r, your input function, if it happens to be even or odd, you can either use the, you can use the a sub n's or the b sub n's where applicable and ignore essentially half of the computation. So if f of r is even or f of t is even, we only have even or cosine terms. If f of r is odd, we only have odd or sine terms. And what we speak of is Fourier cosine or sine series. So that's all I've got to say about the Fourier series for the moment. I will absolutely be expanding on it in the coming videos. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I might also check out universityphysicstutorials.com.